welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and this is the 2023 Job Market series where I speak with young scholars entering the academic job market about their latest research on India. Our last scholar in the series this year is Rajat Kochar, a postdoctoral scholar at University of Chicago's Energy and Environment Lab. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Southern California and his research lies in the field of environmental economics, in particular on understanding the factors that incentivize adaptation to climate shocks. We discussed his paper, Does Market Power in Local Agricultural Markets Hinder Farmer Climate Change Adaptation? We talked about the impact of distortionary policies and regulations on farmers' ability to cope with weather shocks in India, the agricultural produce market system, the choice of crop mix, and the effectiveness of water audits in the UK, and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit mercatus.org slash podcast. Hi, Raja. Thanks so much for being here. This is such a pleasure. Thank you, Shruti. This is actually one of my favorite topics. I mean, both in terms of climate change and the agricultural sector and market distortions and everything crazy that's happening in India. It's also been in vogue a lot because India tried to actually get rid of the APMC laws. These are the Agricultural Produce Market Committee laws and the Mondays. But before we get into the broader political economy context of this, what you're looking at is something very specific. You're looking at the effect of competition in the produce market that farm farmers face when they actually go to sell their produce and how that impacts how farmers are able to cope with negative weather shocks, right? And in India, we as it is have a broken system. There are problems when it comes to irrigation. There are issues when it comes to information about weather shocks and also how frequently they've been sort of coming about given rising temperatures and climate change and so on. And what you find is quite interesting that actually the market structure quite significantly impacts farmers' ability to cope with a negative climate shock or, you know, effects of short-run climate change and so on. And this effect is quite large. You find that they're able to have a f- almost 5% higher output for each additional day of extreme heat. And the way they're able to do that is by increasing agricultural inputs. But this is only farmers who are selling their produce in a relatively more competitive system of agricultural mundis and farmers who are not selling in that competitive system are not able to cope with these sort of weather shocks quite as well. Before we get into what this means and so on, can you first just walk us through what is this agricultural produce market committee or mundi landscape in India? And and then we can get into the rest of it. Right. So thanks, Truti. That was actually a great summary. So the APMC or the Agricultural Produce Marketing Committee, these are basically the physical spaces that have been set up by the government of India where farmers are required to go and sell their produce. So basically a farmer, let's say they harvest their crop and then they have to take this produce to these APMC mandis and there will be intermediaries there who will bid for the commodity and they'll uh, offer the farmers a specific price. The laws are somehow strange in the sense that these are state-specific laws. And what tends to happen is that a farmer, let's say, if you're looking at Punjab and Haryana, it's not possible for a farmer to go from Punjab and sell their produce in a mandi in Haryana. So this is the kind of variation that I'm using in these APMC mandis to answer questions related to climate shocks. But basically, the structure is that a farmer has to go and sell their produce to intermediaries in these physical locations that have been set up by the government. Except if it comes to fruits and vegetables, they're more or less not allowed to sell their produce to private corporations. And therefore, they have to sell it to the specific mandi and they cannot cross state borders. So now that we have this general landscape, How does this impact competition and how much of that are you able to observe and measure? You know, at what degree of granularity can you tell us about how competitive Mandi A in region X is relative to Mandi B in region Y? Right. So think of it this way. So let's say I'm a farmer today and I have two Mandis in my state. 
Now, if Monday A is closer to me, I would prefer to go to Monday A. The problem is that if Monday B is extremely far off, then even though Monday B exists in my particular state, it's very hard for me to go there because first of all, it will add to the transportation costs. So the way the competition is measured, and this is actually taken from an Allen and Atkins Econometrica paper, where what they use is three things. So first, there are three variables that go into the competition. So for each Monday, we calculate this competition measure. And it's dependent on three factors, like I said. The first one is how many Mondays are around me. If there are 20 Mondays around me versus if there's only one Monday in my state, the place with 20 Mondays will have more competition because a farmer has 20 extra options, 20 outside options. The second thing that we look at is the distance between these Mondays. So even if let's say there are 20 Mondays, but all of them are 100 kilometers away from me, that's a problem. And the third thing that we look at is the size of these markets. So I was very surprised to see uh, when I was actually researching on this, that the size of the Mondays is not uniform across India. Some places have these large markets where farmers can come in. They have storage facilities, whereas in some cases you don't have a storage facility. You just have a platform, right? And because you just have a platform, we assume that the Mandi is not that large. So we take into account also the size of the Mandi, which we capture by the amount of trade that has happened in the last 20 years. So this is sort of uh, similar to, you know, Shomitra Chatterjee and looking at sort of spatial composition and how that impacts market power within agricultural markets, right? Or are there more layers added on to that? So the only layer that was added on to Shomitra Chatterjee's paper was the size of this market. Because I also wanted to take into account that some markets are just bigger. So the fact that a market is bigger, you probably have higher competition there because there are more intermediaries. So I actually want to go to a bigger market rather than a smaller market. So now that we understand that, you know, you can both figure out legally what the APMC laws are, and now you can actually do that at the granular level. I wanted to ask you the same question about weather shocks, right? So what do we mean by weather shocks or negative weather shocks when it comes to farmers? Aren't these different for different kinds of produce and different kinds of farmers in different kinds of regions? So what is a good way to think about this for what you are trying to measure? Right. So there has been so many advancements in meteorological data recently. So you have this extremely spatially granular data on the temperature and precipitation. So what we did in our paper was that we take these Usually they're nine kilometers by nine kilometers or four kilometer by four kilometer uh, grids. And they give you the amount of time that was spent in that in a particular temperature bin within that grid. So then what you can calculate is that for a particular crop, let's say Rabi or a Kharif crop, you know exactly the number of hours that a particular crop spent from the day of sowing to the day of harvest in a particular temperature range. So what we did and how we define weather shocks here is that we basically classify the amount of hours spent for a crop from, let's say, 0 to 15 degrees, then 5 degree temperature bin. So we have 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 25 to 30, so on and so forth, up until 35 and higher. And so in our paper, we call a weather shock as temperatures that are above 35 degrees Celsius. And this is actually, you can change these temperature bins. You can have 32 degrees Celsius, 35 degrees Celsius. We just tend to follow the Robin Burgess and Michael Greenstone paper where they look at mortality and that was 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. And so exactly that's what we are doing. But also we can carry out robustness checks with specific different temperature ranges. So basically, I mean, when we're talking about negative weather shocks, you're really talking about heat. But does that also mean uh, it's interconnected to drought? in some way or access to water? Is that part of the temperature measurement or is that something separate you need to look at separately? So I would say that drought is more a long-term phenomenon. So we are looking at the number of hours that a particular crop spends in a temperature range. It's possible that the drought is more a long-term phenomena where you look at the number of days where there was no precipitation or something. So no, we are looking at very short term weather shocks and drought is more like a long term phenomena that we don't really look at in this particular paper. But you're right, that's something that we can also look at. Now, you find that farmers who are going to the more competitive Mondays actually end up dealing with these shocks better. Their output is actually better than farmers who are going to less competitive Mondays. So the first question I have is, how do the farmers in more competitive Mondays actually manage to accomplish that? And then I want to talk about what's the underlying mechanism that is at play making all of this work. Right. So you're absolutely right. So what we tend to find is that if there is a farmer and they have access to more Mondays, when there is a climate shock, they basically 
don't lose as much produce as a farmer does who is not in a very competitive place. And the effect is somewhere to the extent of 4.5% for every additional degree day of heat. And then we look at the mechanisms. The mechanisms are something very interesting. The, you could have a lot of potential mechanisms here, but the thing that we were most interested in was actually following from Shomitra Chatterjee's paper. And he looks at prices. There is already a pre-existing difference in prices, which Shomitra Chatterjee also finds. What we find is that this difference tends to get exacerbated. And the, and, the, and the logic is simple, right? In a climate shock, you would expect the supply falls. Because the supply falls, and let's say the short-run demand is fixed or inelastic, you would expect that prices will rise. What we find is that these prices rise, but more in high competition areas. And the farmer knows this. The farmer, in anticipation of these higher prices, then they go to the changing their input usage, which ultimately helps them alleviate some of the negative impacts of climate shocks. So now that is directly going into how the farmers, you know, sort of organization of their farming activity is taking place on each farm, right? So if they expect that it's going to be a more competitive market, and that's going to actually give them access to better prices and so on. Now, they are more likely to take on additional risk of putting in more inputs in the expectation that they will likely get a better price. Do I understand that? Correctly, that's the expectation. That's the expectation. And it, is in, and it is in anticipation of this higher price that farmers are like, okay, I know that there has been a climate shock, but I also know that if I spend more money on a, let's say, irrigation, I call a truck and I ask them to water or something like that. If that tends to happen, they can spend that money because they know that they will be able to recoup at least some of that because of the increase in prices that has happened due to the supply shock. And in some sense, that's not surprising, right? Farmers actually get better prices when there is a negative supply shock, as long as they are not the farmer facing the negative supply shock, right? So that's typically how that works out. So the expectation is if there's a negative weather shock, they think, oh, this year is going to be a bad crop year for some other farmers. But if I manage to actually put in additional inputs and save my produce or increase my produce, I will end up getting access to far better prices. Is that about right? That's absolutely right. Another interesting aspect of this and that I want to study in future papers is basically how much of this markdown, right? So it's a monopsony power and how much of this markdown is actually being passed on to the farmer by the intermediary. So is it possible that there has been an increase or decrease in markdowns caused by climate shocks? And that's an interesting question that I don't study in this paper, but that is something of interest, I think, because it's possible that climate shocks may increase or even decrease inequality. So there is this possibility of a result going both ways. And that's something that's interesting to study as well. So, you know, one of the main mechanisms through which the farmers are able to overcome this negative weather shock is increasing the inputs that they are adding to their production process. Now, I'm thinking about whether that's almost a sort of perverse trade-off in the sense that to overcome a short-term weather shock, you need to increase inputs, which may end up going into a space where you damage long-run climate change problems because, you know, you may be boring too much to tap into groundwater, for instance, right? Or you might run a diesel generator a little too much, right? And and start polluting the environment. Or it could be, uh, you know, an increased use of fertilizer, which will, uh, you know, worsen your soil quality in the long run. So do you see this trade-off? And is that trade-off being fundamentally caused by more competitive agricultural markets? No, that's a great question. Honestly, I haven't thought of this that well, but I know that there's a paper and you must be knowing that the Chatterjee and Zaveri paper where they basically see that groundwater extraction can be a problem in the long run. So I think, yes, in the sense that when you have these farmers who are basically tapping into input usage, they can harm long term adaptation. And that's actually pretty interesting because even in this paper, the first part is basically we find that there has been no long run adaptation. So farmers are adapting in the short run, but it's a problem that they are not being able to adapt in the long run. And actually, this is not just relevant to India, but also in the US where Marshall Burke and Kyle Embrick actually find this, that there has been no long run adaptation in the US. So it is very much possible. I don't know the mechanisms yet, but it's possible that's because they tend to overuse some of these inputs, which harm them in the long run. But you know what, Shaumitra Chatterjee, Rohit Lamba, Isha Zaveri, what they find in that paper on groundwater, you know, tapping, if I remember it correctly, what they find is it is actually farm subsidies 
and you know minimum support prices that is really what is distorting the incentives such that people actually tap in more and more into groundwater usage it is not market power that is driving their result so i guess what i'm asking you is market competition that driving force which is going to you know start impacting long run climate change sort of both decisions at the micro farmer level and sort of you know larger agricultural level is in market competition that's going to push that over the edge because what they find is the opposite right they are looking at non market they they're looking at less competitive terrible government subsidies you know that actually lead people in punjab and haryana to export you know water based grains and produce in areas which uh, you know should not be producing that but they do it because of the minimum support price Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That's a very interesting point, and I hadn't thought of it that way. Another thing here, right? We also find evidence that there has been a change in crop mix. So now, if you are actually changing the crop mix, it's not going to negatively impact at least your long run adaptation through usage of higher inputs, right? So that is one way to minimize the negative impact on long run adaptation by changing the crop mix. So, for example, if the government feels that oh, with higher market competition, farmers have an incentive to use more inputs, it's possible that they can actually uh, incentivize them to change their crop mix. We have we do find evidence of some of that. We use a Herfindahl index to basically show that the crop mix increases with an increase in climate shocks in areas with higher market competition. So that is something that is also can also be looked at. So yes, there are not just this strategy of using inputs. We also show that there is this other strategy where you can also change your crop mix. I guess the other thing that might be interesting to look at is, you know, there's a set of inputs that can be used to increase the output, and. they are both complements and substitutes right so sometimes you can substitute fertilizer use for increased use of water or quality of seeds or something else right so it would be interesting to see if during negative shocks they are farmers are more likely to indulge or overuse those inputs which are subsidized relative to those inputs that have rational market pricing and then you can quite cleanly separate the difference between what is the market competition driven effect versus what is the subsidy distortionary effect right so i think that might be the next step question that i would ask <laughs> no and and i and i think that's super interesting and that's easily been that can easily be done because you know exactly the inputs which have been distorted by the entity yes. of the government and, and Also to what extent and also to what extent so yeah you can always check that which are the inputs that are actually being used more and that way we don't tend to blame market competition then no it's not so much about blame it's more about what is driving the short run versus long run mechanisms right and why is it that farmers who are normally the you know it's a profession that's gone on for a very long time often times it's uh, hereditary it's done at the family level passed on from parents to children and uh, why is it that this group won't think long term when other people would think long term right so there's something funky going on in the system either being driven by the output markets or being driven by input markets that making them not think in the long yeah. run exactly yeah it, it it could be more or less to do with subsidies but you're right that's something that needs to be tested and seen as to how market competition could incentivize people to use inputs that are not good in the long run so one other thing i want to ask you is how does this entire system work when there is a negative shock right so presumably when there is a negative weather shock it's not a single farmer who's affected by it nor is a single intermediary affected by it uh, so it's that entire region right of people who and these are repeat interactions right it's the same intermediaries or very similar group of intermediaries buying from very similar groups of farmers so are there other things that you see going on within those networks that help with either over extraction in the short run or help cope in the short run versus long run that is being driven by both ends both the demand and the supply ends because this is such a repeat game among a relatively small number of players yeah so that's a great question because when i've presented this paper a lot of people have said that why is it the case so you are i mean to put it in the political context right there were some farmers that actually were not happy with repealing the farm laws and then you would expect as to why that is the case that what is actually happening and then you tend to look at this literature on relational contracts so you can expect that intermediaries and farmers have a good relationship right because there is this repeat interaction and then it's possible that the farmers told by the intermediary that listen i won't be able to offer you a higher price this time but i can help you for example with the marriage of your daughter or your son later on so i'll give you a loan i'll pass you off a loan right 
in that sense, it's, I think, important to understand that how are these repeat interactions also maybe nullifying the negative impacts of the farm laws. So that's something that is yet to be studied. I haven't seen papers that yet do that. And that could also relate to what is happening with these increased uh, climate shocks and where is the excess, uh, the prices that you get due to the supply shock passing on to? Is it possible that farmers are now getting a bigger share or are intermediaries still keeping a bigger share and not passing it off because they are helping them, let's say, to get a loan or to help with the marriage of their children later on? Yeah, so then that's a much more specific question of producer and consumer surplus that is, you know, and how that split works in a repeat game. When we are talking about these kinds of climate change adapting strategies, another not so short run strategy is questions like cold storage, right? Better warehousing, better transportation, because that is also a substitute for, you know, being trapped in the regional market. So whether your regional market is more competitive or whether it falls under this very tight and restrictive APMC licensing, the biggest problem with all of it is that it's regional, right? And not in a sense, national or global. And national and global, it's once again, a question of the kinds of inputs you have, the kind of cold storage you have, warehousing you have. So what does that look like when you start thinking about weather shocks? Do those systems sort of become more important in terms of coping? That is in good weather years, you're able to smooth out, hopefully for bad weather years and have like a long term adaptation strategy? Or am I going too far? This is much more specific. Long term adaptation strategies have really nothing to do with this kind of smoothing out of agricultural supply shocks more generally. So I think the best adaptation strategy here is conditional on you wanting to be a farmer, right? You should be changing your crop mix or using these high yielding variety of seeds, which can handle, let's say, these climate shocks, right? But the interesting part, and that is also I'm studying in a few other papers that I'm working on right now, is I think the best adaptation strategy for farmers, if they suffer from repeated climate shocks, one of the best strategies is basically to migrate out, right? And the thing is then, if you talk about, oh, what are the, uh, yes, cold storage will help, everything will help, but ultimately what's going to happen is that if you want to increase your income, you have to migrate out. So I think one of the strategies that the government can potentially look at is how can it create more urban jobs, which can then help attract some of these surplus labor in the rural areas. An interesting part there, and uh, I'm working with Klima Imbert on this, is uh, Narega. Now, the problem is this with Narega, right? The Narega problem is that if I have a program incentivized by the government for me to work in case there is, let's say, no jobs for me, I have lesser incentive to adapt by moving out because I know that even if there's a climate shock that hits me, I have this Narega policy to fall back on. But that Narega policy is not like a long run adaptation thing, right? How long will you continue with Narega or how long will you just allow people to come in and work and uh, do unproductive work? And there's so, also a limit on the number of days uh, that exactly. Narega so can be so, so, so it's 100 days or something, right? And so the interesting question that I wanted to study was that where this Narega is being implemented really well, do we see farmers adapting by not moving out and actually using more inputs because they know that, okay, even if the crop fails, I have this safe, sure option of going and working in Narega. Whereas in places where Narega is not that well implemented, it's possible that farmers actually move out due to climate shocks. So the problem with actually modeling adaptation in a model is that there are so many avenues that you can yeah. use to adapt, right? This has to be a general equilibrium uh, yeah, exactly. question after. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you can only look at it in a paper, at least in a single paper, you can only look at a few adaptation <laughs> mechanisms. But you can, for example, move out, you can migrate out, you can basically... Uh, but also then who migrates out, right? And that's an interesting point that I wanted to look at, which is, is it possible that I have four sons and I know that two of them can stay in the village and I can send two of them away? Household dynamics also play a part in who can migrate out and how you adapt. So adaptation that way is a very, very interesting sphere of study that actually is just being catching up with economists because most of the times we were just focusing on mitigation, right? How do we do carbon mitigation? But now the IPCC comes and says that, listen, there's going to be climate shocks, there's going to be climate change, there is some effects that cannot be reversed. So now how we adapt is, I think, the more interesting part. 
Yeah, and you know, on this, I guess you can study things very specifically, one distortionary question at a time or effect at a time. Or you can also sort of imagine a different landscape, right? What if we dramatically re-envision agricultural sector, right? We start liberalizing agriculture, whether in, you know, one question is, of course, of terrible inputs and distortionary inputs. But there are also other restrictions, right? Converting agricultural land use. There are questions of all sorts of MSPs and what people end up producing as opposed to what is better suited for that climate. There are questions of land holding size. Very large part of the increased input use is because of land holding size. So that's the paper that I'm actually writing now with someone. Tell me more. It's just in a very, very initial phase. So we are downloading actually this data from the agricultural census about land holding size. And we're trying to understand that does land holding size play an important role in whether farmers are able to mitigate some of the negative impacts. So I'll give you an example, right? In Bangladesh, one of my friends was working on this, Islamud, who's at Yale now. And he sees that in areas where you have these climate shocks happening regularly, Farmers with increased land holding size were actually able to adapt better. And the reason was through shrimp farming. So what tends to happen is for shrimp farming, you need a bigger land size. So you let the seawater come in and then you actually have a shrimp business. But that's only possible if you have a large land holding size. So that is something that I was very interested in looking at in India as well. So we're looking at that. I don't have results right now to share with you, but that is something that I'm very interested in. So you're absolutely right. Land land holding size plays a role. What the government distortions are doing, they play a role. Market competition plays a role. Uh, a lot of interesting things out there. Yeah. This is really a, a super fun area. And I, I, I think there is a lot more thought to be given to, you know, short run versus long run adaptation strategies and, you know, some thought on whether they are aligned in the same direction and not actually, you know, trading off against each other in some other way. I want to ask you, like sort of the political economy of the APMC itself, this is very indirectly related to your paper, but you have a discussion in there on how the intermediaries are, you know, not only able to extract rents and sort of, uh, you know, curtail competition, curtail diversity in crops, like all sorts of effects. But the other part is who becomes an APMC Mundi licensed trader in the first place? These are typically people who are highly influential in that area who have, you know, some kind of political connections or oftentimes family members of the politicians end up becoming APMC traders and all. Can you tell me a little bit more about that landscape and how hard it is to transition out of that landscape? Right. So I think Shomitra also refers to this in his paper. It was very interesting for me to see that the person who grants you a license. So that's another interesting thing, right? APMC laws also make sure that you just know not everyone can become an intermediary. You or I just cannot go and buy from the farmers in the APMC markets today. We need a license. And the interesting question is that who gives you a license? It's basically the existing intermediaries who give you yes. a license. Yes. And so they clearly so it's a club. Have yeah, exactly. It's a club. And they have an incentive to not give you the license because, of course, the more the players, the more the competition, which will increase the price to these farmers and reduce the amount of rent that they are seeking. So, yeah, so that was very surprising that it's basically the intermediaries themselves who decide who gets to trade in these markets. In that sense, yes, I think changing even the licensing rules and who can come in and actually buy the produce of the farmer can go a long way. So even if, for example, let's say removing the APMC structure is very hard, right? Just removing the licensing structure in that particular area. But again, the intermediaries may go up in arms against the government. So I, I don't know how politically feasible these things are. Yeah, this is an area where there is not one, but like six transitional gains traps all laid out one after the other. Exactly. And so therefore also what I study in the paper is what if this removing these state borders, how will that help, right? Another thing that you can study is adding more Mondays and see how that helps uh, with long run adaptation. You can also see, for example, if we improve the highways between different Mondays and it's possible that brings down the transportation costs and so how that will help. So a lot of different avenues that the government can use. It's just a matter of, I think, time as well as how politically feasible these things are. Yeah, but the system is fundamentally irrational. You know, after reading your work, Shamitra's work, I am beginning to realize APMC is not the reason for all the flaws and problems in agriculture. But it's the system is so irrational, it literally has no reason to exist. <laughs> I think that I'm convinced of. <laughs> yeah, and I go into the history of it a little bit too in the paper. And it's basically started when the Britishers were trying to fleece us off cotton and they wanted the mills in Manchester to use the cottons. So they started it. It just tend to happen that we were so influenced by the Soviets that of a 
centralized economy that we thought that APMCs were the best way to go forward. And surprisingly, we haven't built that many markets since 2001 as well. So we stopped building markets. We continued with the centralized structure. So changing any of that will actually help, I think, to reduce the distortions in the market. Yeah. So now I want to get into the other paper that you're working on. And this is quite interesting. It's about water audits. Now, this is not in India. It's done in the UK. And you look at what is the effectiveness or the impact of conducting water audits, as opposed to other kinds of mechanisms that, you know, one can think of uh, to encourage water saving or water conservation and so on. So, you know, I'll let you describe the paper. And then I want to talk to you about As an economist, my prior is that the price mechanism is fantastic at allocation, right? I mean, it may have lots of other flaws with it that people like to keep pointing out. But the one flaw it doesn't have, especially in a market as thick as water, is allocation, right? It rationalizes people's use extremely well. So now, you know, so I want to talk about how that system stacks up against other kinds of systems like audits or, you know, PR sort of campaigns and social campaigns and so on. But let me first ask you about the paper itself. Right. So this paper, it's with Robert Metcalf and Robert Hahn. So what we do in this paper is that there was a field experiment that was done in the UK. We did this with Northumbrian Water Limited. And this is the water utility in the north of the UK. And we wanted to see that can we incentivize people to join a water audit program And this water audit program was then meant to conserve water, right? And the whole thing is because UK actually has a climate act that wants utilities to take actions to reduce water usage. So we designed seven different kinds of interventions. And most of these interventions were basically, we give you a letter and we ask you that, oh, can you please download this audit, which will help you save water. But the audits were basically looking at different behavioral aspects. One of them was basically comparing your water usage to your neighbor. The other one was giving you a financial incentive. And we also changed the size of the financial incentive. So we give you 10 pounds versus we give you 15 pounds. We also try to, for example, uh, evoke environmental concerns in you. So like there's an environmental aspect to it. And what we tend to find, I mean, it's not surprising, honestly, is basically that people tend to take up the audit when we give them money, right? Evoking the moral cost or altruism is good, but it's not as effective as me giving you 10 or 15 pounds to download the audit. And then we use IV strategy to basically show that it reduces water consumption. Just downloading the audit reduces water consumption by 17% or actually it's somewhere close to 37 to 40 liters per day. And this is the UK. So the household water consumption is not as high. It's around 250 liters per day per household. So it's actually a 17 to 20% reduction, which was pretty cool. But then we also wanted to look at that, whether it is cost effective from the government's point of view to do that. And so we use a marginal value of public funds approach. Now, what this approach basically is, is how much bang for buck is the government getting? So if government actually spends $1 on a particular project, how much benefit is it getting from that program? And what we find is that these programs actually are not that effective for the government. And specifically, the reason is that even though the water consumption reduces, the greenhouse gas benefits from reducing that water consumption are not as high as the costs of implementing these program. And the costs include, for example, me sending you letters, me giving you financial incentives, me also spending time filling out surveys, filling out audits, letting people come into my house to audit me. So stuff like that, I think that takes up a lot of cost and the benefits are not that high. Now, coming to your question of price mechanisms, We know prices work. It's just impossible to use that mechanism in a randomized control trial because... I I understand. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So My question is a little bit simpler, right? Like clearly a a financial incentive is working on the audit side. So I imagine that these people are rational individuals who respond to incentives. And if they just priced the water appropriately, then without this enormous machinery of water audits and things like that, you would get a similar effect, except now it's being managed by pricing water better. I'll give you a funny example. So so we are actually doing an experiment on the salience of prices in Westminster, Colorado. So it's a small town. And the thing is that recently they had a mayor recalled simply because he tried to increase the prices. And the thing was that prices are a very political issue, especially with relation to, let's say, electricity and water utilities. So when you try to increase prices or let's say charge differential prices, so let's say I'm trying to do first, second, third, third degree price discrimination there, 
it's just very impossible to implement politically. So I think in a democracy, it's very difficult to use prices as an instrument specifically and target individuals based on their water usage. Of course, you can charge higher usage people more money, but then how do you identify those people? And we're trying to run a few experiments there, but not with prices. It's just very difficult to run these prices. But you're absolutely right. Prices are the best way. We just we are not following the first best. We're following the second best simply because the first best can just not be used right now. Yeah, and you're finding that the second best is actually extremely costly. It's got all these implementation problems. And frankly, the other thing I always fear with audits is if they will lose their long run effectiveness. Right. So in the short run, things like PR campaigns, audits, all these things have, you know, these interventions have effects. They usually disappear in the long run, whereas what we find with prices is the opposite. Right. Prices actually strengthen and become more robust as allocation mechanisms over the long run relative to even the short run. Where lots of people will grumble and write letters and try to make it go away and, you know, all of that stuff. So I'm always like when I I know exactly what you're saying about the political side of it and being difficult. But when I read papers as an economist, my first prior is, why aren't we just doing the simple thing that we know works really well? Do you have that kind of a reaction when you always. study these I, markets? I, 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 I always have a reaction about that. But then I also realize that in a democracy, it's just not politically feasible to change prices and increase it. So I'll give you an example, right? I also have a paper on floods and um, the impact of floods on nightlights. So we look at nightlights, we're trying to understand how economic activity changes, right? One of the things that we looked at was the dynamics of recovery. So for example, if nightlights fall after a flood, how long do they take to come back? Now, again, this is by no means a policy recommendation. But what we find is that authoritative regimes tend to do better when it comes to that, because it's just the case that there is centralization, right? With all these water utilities, with all these electric utilities, there is always this case of how can you control the externalities? How can you price in the externalities? Authoritative regimes can do that better simply because there is centralization. Similarly, you know, they can actually charge higher prices to high consumers because they don't have this political considerations to think of. So when you say authoritarian regimes, I just want to understand, I mean, what, what degree of authoritarian are we talking? Because when I look at the map of North Korea, there are no nightlights, right? So, so what is the degree of authoritarianism that is at play here? So there is this data set that we use. It goes from minus 10 to plus 10. And so minus 10 representing extreme authoritarian regimes, plus 10... No, but like, for example, you know, what are the countries yeah, yeah. So we're talking about? What are the regions we're talking about? Okay, so when it comes to authoritarian regimes, most of them are actually going to be in Africa, North Korea, China. However, interestingly, we removed China and then we still find the same effects. So it's not just China that is driving these results. It's also the case that authoritative regimes tend to do better simply because also because I think they are scared of the fact that there'll be an upheaval and that which could throw them off power. It's again, it's a mechanism we are not sure of yet. It's just something, an effect that we find that authoritative regimes, the recovery dynamics are better. So I have a follow up question on that. Is it that authoritarian regimes have less of a budget constraint for these utility companies and can more easily pass it on to the taxpayer and so on? Whereas democratic or more accountable regimes will actually need these utility companies to somewhat be fiscally viable, right? So is that what's driving the result as opposed to the authoritarianism? That is potentially possible. So like I said, it was this is a very macro-based argument that I gave you, authoritarian regimes, but there could be a lot of mechanisms behind that. One of them, like you said, could simply be that I can pass on the cost to the taxpayer versus in, the, in, in, a, in a democracy, it's very difficult for me to do that. It's just not possible, feasibly possible for me to actually increase the price. You just control for uh, loss making or the extent of the loss making of the utility company and then go from there. And that will give you some sense of, uh, you know, what is really at play here. Because this runs counter to the intuition that, for instance, Besley and Burgess find, right? Which is in, in democratic countries with the transparent media and so on, you're less likely to have famines, right? You have more responsive government towards these kinds of big shocks. So it's a counterintuitive response. Results. So that's interesting to me, what you're yeah, finding. And, and, and also one of my uh, friends, who's Ian G. Kwan, she's at the University of Cincinnati. And what she finds is that it matters a lot when the shock occurs. So basically, let's say, let's say there's a flood, right? And it occurs right before the elections are going to happen. You'll basically see that the recovery dynamics are much faster as compared to, let's say, the shock occurs after the election is over and the person is already in power. Yeah. So that's the reason I have a sense that this might have less to do with uh, democracy versus authoritarianism versus some other set of incentives and, you know, ability to pass on costs to some other players and, and so on. But it's certainly very interesting. I would love to read this. 
yeah yeah there's there's a lot of potential for uh, like the, the, the political economy of adaptation and disasters is i think something that's very interesting and also of like just carbon mitigation or even uh, mitigation of uh, excess water use so 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 yeah all these things matter a lot no this is fascinating thank you so much for talking about your research and and for sharing all this work this was a pleasure yeah thank you so much shruti I really enjoyed the conversation thank you Ideas of India is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Help us grow by giving us a rating and leaving a review. Follow us on Twitter at S Rajagopalan and at Ideas of India. Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com.